after the time the pound sign. Okay. Yes. Hey. My name is uh, Mike Evans. I'm the science operations officer at the National Weather Service Forecast Office in Binghamton, New York. And talk, so I'm just going to talk about a uh, kind of an event that we experienced in our area last summer. Um, you know, we get uh, uh, tornadoes uh, in our area, and this was where we actually had seven on one day. So I'm going to talk about it a little bit here. Trying to hit the arrow. There we go. Okay, so again, here's the background. Um, we had a lot of severe storms that moved across southern New York and northern Pennsylvania by 26, uh, 2012. And you can see here on the map, uh, each one of our tornadoes that we had on this day is uh, is plotted here. We call it the Twin Tiers uh, severe weather and tornado outbreak. We call this the area that uh, the tier or the southern tier of New York in the tier of Pennsylvania. These were tornadoes. Uh, what was unusual about them, they were on the ground for quite a while, some of them. One was on the ground for 14 miles, and one was on the ground for, I believe, about nine miles, and it traveled right across downtown Elmira. Elmira is a uh, kind of a small city with a, a population of about 50 or 60,000. As you might imagine, that did a fair amount of damage. The advancing seems to be real slow here. I uh, hit the row and uh, um, not much. Mike, the down arrow on your keyboard. Okay. Oh, that's what I'll use. Okay. Um, so, and then um, I'll talk about in this talk the uh, large scale pattern. Uh, sounding, uh, I'll look at some soundings and some SPC analysis. And then I'm going to have a little bit of time to compare this event to some previous uh, convective severe lines that we've had, and then I'll put it in the summary and conclusion. Okay. This uh, right here just shows the 250 millibar winds and contours and shading. Uh, shading is the wind speed, and the 250 millibar heights are in the white contours. And you can see that um, we were sort of event sort of on the southern edge of the westerlies. There was a theme tracking across the northern U.S. with a um, in winds over southern Quebec into northern New England. So again, that puts southern New York and northern Pennsylvania in here on the, uh, sort of in the southern edge of the westerlies, and sort of roughly in this in right entrance region of this upper level jet that was over Quebec. At first, you can see there's a uh, a trough moving through the Great Lakes uh, in area, and again, uh, kind of a large upper level ridge covering the southern United States and, and kind of on the southern edge of the West Release. At, uh, at the surface, um, just looking at a, a, a broad look at things, just a large area of sort of weakly organized low pressure extending from Michigan into the northeast United States. This is 18 Z left and then uh, 0 Z on the 27th on the right. So, so uh, tracks very slowly off to the east during this time period. But, um, but the basic uh, take-home point here is that the, the surface pressure systems are this not very strong or, or not even very well defined. Now, closer at the surface, uh, this is 20 around the time when the event was getting started. Lopener over eastern Lake Ontario, a trough extending southward from the low into central Pennsylvania, and see the surface triggering mechanism for the storms. There was a cloud edge that was sort of, you could see on the satellite, uh, extending from southern New York into uh, eastern New York. Very south of 
these uh, clouds. It was temperatures were in the low 90s with the dew points in the lakes across the, um, central Pennsylvania, while to the north, uh, somewhat lower temperatures, maybe in the uh, upper to the low 80s with dew points in the 60s. A cross section from eastern New York southward into northwest Pennsylvania. Uh, this is a cross section of the equivalent potential temperature in the green contours and the vertical motion uh, cast by the rock uh, shaded. And you see, it looks like there was a, a low level front or a surface front in northwest Pennsylvania. There was a front aloft um, over sort of central New York and the seem to trigger along the uh, leading edge of this front aloft here, uh, also in association with that with that surface uh, that developed to the lee of the cold front. It's a very common scenario for uh, our area. The storms typically um, east of the actual surface cold front, uh, co-located with the front aloft and with the uh, with this sort of trough that often often develops in the lee of the uh, elevations of the Appalachian Mountains. from Pittsburgh, South Pennsylvania, uh, in, in the morning of this event. And the thing that was of interest here is that there appears to be one of those elevated mixed layers, in the, about 850 millibars up to about 650 millibars. And so a lot of uh, recent research in the, uh, in the, over the Northeast United States the last few years, uh, probably a, a good paper that came out from Banicos and Exter that talked about the importance of elevated mixed layers the development of severe weather over the Northeast. So I'm interesting that, that, that one of these did appear to be on the York sounding. Of course, with the southwest, general uh, west-southwesterly flow, that air mass would have been advected um, east and east across uh, central and northern Pennsylvania during the To a, a, a brief uh, look here at the uh, water imagery for this event, you can see this area of dryness over the populations in southern Pennsylvania, and storms developed on the northern edge of that uh, of that dry slot over northern Pennsylvania and southern New York. Model data. These are model forecast soundings from the uh, rock on uh, that, but in the background, I think it was still in the rock. Um, uh, Avoca in Pennsylvania, and would, would have been just downstream of the line as, as it developed over north central Pennsylvania and southern New York. And you see um, you know, moderately large instability over the area and turning strong wind fields, basically turning wind fields. Um, in the, are hard to read here, but they're around 2,500 joules per kilogram over this forecast sounding valid at 22Z. It needs mid level wind speed. Steering flow are around 40 to 45 knots. Also some convective parameters for Elmira itself from the SREF. Uh, that was uh, the three Z SREF, so the SREF that was run uh, in the early morning from this event. And, uh, looking at the capes during the day of interest here, the values range anywhere from about a thousand to th over 2,000 joules per kilogram. There's a wide range in forecast capes from the SREF. That's because Ira was forecast to be on the gradient between very high capes to the south and much capes to the north over New York. So uh, the capes from Ira averaged out maybe close to 2,000, but again, range. Also here, the uh, approximately the zero to three kilometer shear averaging out around 20 meters per second. Forty knots. That's a you know pretty pretty high for our area. And then uh, some mesoanalysis data from uh, the Storm Prediction Center. Uh, this cape, or I think this is a mixed layer cape, showing values as high as 4,000 over central and southern Pennsylvania. So it's just about off the charts, uh, just to the south of the area. But then you large gradient with values under 1,000 over central New York. The deep layer shear was being maximized over upstate New York with 40 to 50 knots, 
uh, much lower to the south. The storm prediction uh, mesoanalysis of uh, zero diameter energy helicity index and ratio diameter, both minimizing over central and southern Pennsylvania. And uh, just as a review, the energy helicity index is just a function of the Cape uh, helicity from zero to thermometers. The direct deposit um, from the sea is a function of uh, Cape downdraft Cape, uh, layer shear, and deep layer mean wind. So again, it seems to be maximizing in just a little bit south of our area of interest over central and southern Pennsylvania. And then final height and a zero to one kilometer helicity. Previous have certainly shown that those can be important factors uh, for tornadoes. Amount or the the LCL height over southern New York and northern Pennsylvania was 750 meters. So that's around maybe uh, 2,500 feet or so. The so low LCL height favorable for tornado development. It was much higher to the south, uh, the area that was most unstable. And then mean was 0 to 1 kilometer helicity, generally from about 100 to about 150, um, which is a moderately high value. Some, uh, some high res reflectivity from some of the models for this event. Uh, from the 12 kilometer NAM, that was 12Z on the 26th, valid at 21Z on the time the event was getting going. The NAM was forecasting kind of a broken line of, of reflectivity convection over the northern Pennsylvania with some isolated cells uh, further to the north. Here is going to show. Forecast model forecast reflectivity from an even higher uh, resolution model, the three kilometer HRRR model. Uh, these forecasts are all valid at 21Z, but they were run at different times. The earliest run was in the upper left, and the most recent run was in the lower right. And these are kind of hitting on the idea that there'd be some kind of linear convection developing over Pennsylvania um, with the model run that ran only a few hours before the event really in on this line that was going to be forecast to develop from southern New York into uh, into northern and central Pennsylvania. The storm prediction guidance for this event um, was indicating a, uh, a hot, there was a moderate risk of severe weather over our area with even enhanced probability of tornadoes around 5%, um, very close area of interest. So the storm center in this case, in this case about the idea that this could be a, a significant event for our area. So this is what I've been talking about for the last 10 or 15 minutes here. Our final characteristics on the 26th. We were on the southern edge of the westerlies, which is pretty typical for our area in uh, mid, mid to late summer. Uh, we have zonal mid-level flow aloft with just weak uh, height falls forecast. Uh, we have of weak, disorganized area of low pressure over southern New York and northern Pennsylvania, with uh, storms apparently developing on a, on a trough, on a heavy, uh, surface cold front. Uh, we are in an area of a large instability gradient with very unstable air and an elevated mixed layer over Pennsylvania, and an area of, of uh, large deep layer shear. Okay, here we go. Um, so basically what happened then on the 26th is we had this broken line of, uh, of storms that developed. And I've already, already gathered from what I said earlier, this up being a uh, pretty big severe weather outbreak for us. What I want to do is compare some of the environmental characteristics of some of this broken line with some environmental characteristics of some previous uh, warm season uh, linear convective events that also turned out to be really significant for our area. Slides I'm going to show are just sort of a comparison between this event, which is as shown here in the lower left, of the linear convection events. This was a big event that we had back in July 2003, major severe weather event with lots of, lots of uh, wind reports. 
and a couple of tornadoes. This was a big event that we had back in June 2005, and then another big event that we had in May 2009 or 11. So we wanted to compare how did the linear, how did the environmental characteristics for compare with the characteristics from those other previous events? View of what we were sort of expecting to see um, this study to reveal. Uh, this chart right here shows what you might expect in a situation where you have a, uh, a strong info jet and a strong, well-organized linear convection. The main points from this slide are that you'd expect large buoyancy stream from the convective line. Uh, it helps you to get um, strong, a strong uh, updraft and a well-developed cold pool to the, to the rear of the updraft. And if you have strong shear, the updraft can become organized in a sort of a front-to-rear kind of a flow pattern. You get this low that develops kind of on the rear of the storm and to uh, induce a rear inflow jet, and uh, that rear inflow jet can get down to the surface. You can have strong winds. So the point here is that we kind of expect to see buoyancy here um, is sort of what we'd expect to see from, uh, from the last, uh, previous events. Um, we looked at some composites of, uh, of the overall flow for those four events that I just showed. Uh, no surprises here at 500 millibars uh, off to the uh, west of the area over the Great Lakes. Uh, uh, surface low pressure over the eastern Great Lakes. Again, no surprise there. Cold front to the west. And kind of a hint at a, a little bit of a lee trough developing uh, east of the main cold front. Lee trough over southern New York. Pennsylvania, and then composite listed index showing the largest instability. Again, no surprise, kind of focused over uh, Pennsylvania and points south. With New York a little bit uh, more in a gradient, kind of like what uh, what we see in the case. Looked at some box and whisker plots, and again, you can kind of take this a little bit with a grain of salt because it's only based on four. The first thing that you get from the box and whisker plots of um, of, of uh, mixed layer CAPE from proximity settings is that high instability events. You can see ranging anywhere from about, you know, just shot 2,000 up to over 3,500 joules per kilogram. And in, uh, the July 26, 2012 was kind of on the instability, was kind of on the line for these events. So lots of instability. Looking at CAPE, the downdraft CAPE appeared to range anywhere from 500 to 1,000. Uh, joules per kilogram for these events. The shear, the uh, thing that just out here is that the 0 to 1 kilometer shears tended to range from about 10 to 20 knots, but there were very large uh, 30 or, or 0 to 3 kilometer shears ranging from 30 to 45 knots. And then the 6 kilometer shears were not, not too much bigger than the 3 kilometer shears. Right here then, uh, these seem to be characterized by, by last year, especially at zero to three uh, kilometer range, with the range being not that much larger. And then looking at sort of the upper level forcing as indicated by 12 hour, 500 millibar height falls, see that these events are typically associated with height falls, but real large, you know, anywhere from about maybe 10 to 40 uh, meters in about uh, 12 hours. Sounding of a composite of these proximal soundings. Um, these are large CAPE events. The uh, CAPE on this sounding is almost 3,000 joules. We see a veering wind profile on the lowest one to two kilometers, and then a moderately strong, maybe 30 to 50 knot, straight line wind flow in the above uh, three kilometers. Looking at the graph, you can see most of the length of the hodograph was in the lowest, zero, uh, lowest three kilometers. The, uh, you know, is, is not really contributing much to the length of the hodograph. So again, you get that most of the shear in these events is in the lowest uh, three kilometers. So it summarizes then the similarities between this July 26th event and other major warm season convective lines that we've seen over the years in our area. Uh, uh, these events are, are associated often with kind of modest mid-level flow amplification. There is crossing over the Great Lakes, but these aren't, you know, these 
major uh, or events uh, associated with major synoptic scale highly amplified systems or kind of uh, west side flow aloft with a weak trough coming in from the west. Surfaces are over the Great Lakes. A key to look for in our area is, is this highly unstable air over the mid-Atlantic region, uh, often uh, greater than 2,000 joules per kilogram. And that's for strong shear, um, especially in the zero to three kilometer range. That's the last my slides. I'll, I can take any, any questions at this time. On this first presentation. Stop the uh, recording and then I'll.